To quote uh, from Schmeidler who wrote about uh, this, it matters not only what you get, but also how you get it. So turning to Larry, uh, Larry has about 150 publications on just about every aspect of economic theory, from as abstracts were applied, from decision theory and game theory, to industrial organization, and even to labor economics. Larry is a fellow of the American Academy of Science, uh, former president of the Game Theory Society, he has been a co-editor of the AER and of Econometrica, maybe, I think, maybe the only one who ever did so, who was a co-edited two of the top five journals. Uh, Larry is uh, enormously influential in the directions of economic theory has taken and a great contributor to the profession, both professionally and through his research. And finally, Larry is a truly great speaker, so I'm sure we are all going to enjoy his talk today about competitive matching markets. Thank you, Adi, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for coming. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm honored and delighted to be giving the Alicia Posner lecture. Like Adi, I never met Alicia Posner, but I do have a connection. I think that the first paper that I ever read in an economics journal was one of his. This was a paper in 1974 called uh, Difficulty in the Concept of Fairness. It's a wonderful paper. I suggest anyone look at it who hasn't recently. If nothing else, it's remarkable for the succinctness with which it's written, which is a welcome contrast to many of the things that we get to read today. The central point of that paper was that it may be impossible to satisfy two of the criteria we might look for in <coughs> a competitive market, Pareto efficiency and the equity criterion of envy freeness. At first, this seemed impossible that someone could show that this was impossible because in the sorts of models we usually look at, it's easy to find examples that satisfy both of these. When you look at the paper, the ingredient that was missing from most of our ordinary models was <coughs> that seemingly the same good owned by one person was not equivalent to what looked like that same good owned by another person. To put it differently, unlike most of the markets that we model, in that economy it made a difference not only what you trade, but who you trade it with. Now today's talk is about matching markets. Matching markets have become quite popular recently. They've been the subject of considerable theoretical research. They've been the subject of great practical application. And I would say the defining characteristic of a matching market is it matters not only what gets traded, but who trades with whom. When we first start thinking about markets, we draw a supply and demand curve. We put a big dot in the middle and suggest that that's the equilibrium in that market. And in a market like that, all of the buyers are interchangeable. All the sellers are interchangeable. Clearing that market is not too hard. Prices in that market don't have too much to do. They have to sort who's in the market and who's out of the market. But once you have done that sorting, it doesn't matter how you match the people who are in the market. It doesn't matter which buyer is matched up with which seller. In a matching market, determining who's in the market and who's out of the market, that's often the least of what you have to do. The issue is to determine of those in the market who matches with whom. I'm especially be interested today in matching markets with the property that before entering the market, the participants make investments. They make investments that are going to affect their possibilities in this market. They make investments that are going to affect what they can achieve when they match someone in the market. They make investments that affect their attractiveness to the other side of the market. And whereas I would be delighted to have results, to have examples about the combination of both efficiency and equity. The fact is we know relatively little even about efficiency in such markets. And so that's what I will talk about today, the circumstances 
under which we can get these <coughs> investment followed by matching markets to give us efficient outcomes. In particular, I'm interested in the circumstances under which the ex post matching market is going to give incentives to the participants to make efficient investments before they come into the market. I'm going to want to know where the pitfalls might lie, where are the forces that might give us inefficiency, what are the conditions under which we might expect efficient outcomes. Now what kind of markets am I talking about? Here's a picture from my university, Yale University's last commencement. These are people who have just spent typically four years making what is often the most important investment of their lives, their investment in their human capital, and now some of them already have, but many of them now are going to be dropped into a matching market where they're going to look for potential employers who also have been making sometimes massive investments to make themselves productive, to make themselves attractive to, to these candidates. So a leading example that I will want to keep in mind is the market for skilled or specialized labor. There it matters not just who's trading in the market, but this is a case where the buyers on one side care about which seller they match with. The sellers on the other side care about whom they match with. There are many other such markets at the other end of our educational system. Bringing students into universities is another matching market. <coughs> Outside of employment, we can think of professional partnerships. We can think of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. We can think of task assignment within, within firms or within organizations. All of these are versions of matching markets. I'm going to have two sides to my matching market. Given the list of examples that I could stretch even longer, there are many things that I might call the people on the two sides of this market. I'm going to call them buyers and sellers throughout because that's a relatively neutral set of terms for them. Now remember the order. First they make investments and then they participate in the market. So there's a large literature on what that sequence of events usually calls to mind. A large literature on what we think of as the holdup problem. So this is going to be my comment on the holdup problem. A holdup problem arises because someone makes an investment first, and then after they have made that investment, after they've sunk the cost of that investment, they're subject to a market where the other side has market power, where the other side can extract some of the surplus from the person who has already sunk that investment. Competitive matching markets is what we're going to talk about today. The ex post market is going to be competitive. This is going to take hold up problems off the table. And so if we have inefficiencies, it's not going to be because of hold up problems. I think in many circumstances, there are serious concerns about hold-up problems. I think when I look at the market for our graduates that I just looked at, that that's not too unreasonably modeled as a competitive market. We know a lot about the hold-up problem. I want to see what else might be a problem in these markets. The other thing that matching markets bring to mind is competition. Indeed, much of my motivation for getting into this was thinking about our students and wondering whether our students were working too hard or not hard enough. Wondering if these students were competing with one another. They all want to go to the best employers. They all want to go to the best schools. They all understand that it helps them to have a good record, but they also all understand it helps them to have a better record than their peers. And any time we have a situation where it helps someone to have a better record than their peers, uh, we have concerns about positional externalities. We have concerns about these investments being inefficiently aggressive. The opposite of the holdup problem. The usual implication of the holdup problem is we get inefficient underinvestment. Here we might worry about inefficient older in overinvestment as these people engage in an investment arms race to each be relatively higher in the ranking. So here's, here's a person who's concerned about positional externalities. 
And once again, the competitive market is going to take these per positional externalities off the table. The competitive market ensures that these are just the same sort of pecuniary externalities that appear in an ordinary general equilibrium model. It's true that in the matching market, if I'm a seller and I hire one candidate, that the other sellers in the market cannot hire that candidate. But that's an externality no different than saying in an ordinary general equilibrium model, if I buy some of a good, there's less of it available for the others in the market. And that may affect the market prices. We know market prices are equilibrium prices. They depend on all of our excess demands. But that's not an externality that gives us a problem with efficiency. So if there's no holdup problem, there's no positional externalities, what's left? What could go wrong? The basic problem is the markets are incomplete. Where's the incompletement? The, the people in these markets make their investments before they have any idea what's going to happen to them in the matching market. What would a complete market look like in this case? A complete market, when one of our students came to the university, at the same time that they chose a field of study, at the same time that they chose what their university career would look like, so would they sign a contract for their subsequent employment career. And at that same time, so would the seller commit to the terms of that employment, so would the seller commit to the investment that the seller was going to bring, that the other side was going to bring to that relationship. We don't see such kind of contracts in our economy. It's not too hard to imagine why. I certainly imagine many of the students I know, if they could, at the beginning of their studies, already sign a contract that was going to set the terms, the economic terms of the rest of their life, that their motivation to actually carry through on this investment might be somewhat less than you would like. And so I think there are real moral hazard problems that cause these markets to be missing. This is the basic difficulty that we have. Now this literature I trace to a pair of papers, one by Hal Cole and George Maleth and Andy Polstowaite in 2001, one by Mike Peters and Aloysius Chow in 2002, that were quite surprising because they both produced examples of markets in which the two sides first made investments and then entered a competitive matching market. That exhibited efficient equilibria. So before reading that, I would have guessed that there was no way to get an efficient equilibrium out of such a market, that the incompleteness would have been, would have been insurmountable. And so this was my entry into this literature, the beginning of my quest to find out what is it about these markets that potentially causes inefficiency? What is it that we might address with various policy interventions? What are the conditions we might look for to get efficient markets? I believe as the labor markets in our economy become more and more specialized, as we change from an economy built on sort of undifferentiated, unskilled labor to high-tech economies that revolve around human capital, that these kinds of markets, these kinds of issues are going to become more important. I believe eventually this is going to be the sort of usual way we think about markets in our economy instead of the old supply and demand curves that we used to work with. And so I think it's quite important to know something about how these markets work. In the next few minutes, we will talk about circumstances under which efficient equilibria exists. We'll find, in general, they do. So the incompleteness is, in general, not a barrier to efficient outcomes. We're going to find, though, in general, there are lots of other equilibria that are inefficient. We, I'll indicate there's a sense in which we can think of these as coordination failures. We'll look at three sources of inefficiency. People can get their investments wrong. They can get the decision to be in or out of the market wrong. Once in the market, they can get the decision of whom to match with wrong. And I'll look, I'll produce some conditions for these markets to give efficient outcomes. And I put the stringent in question mark there, because on the one hand, you're going to see these conditions are quite familiar. We work with them all the time. 
On the other hand, the combination of them uh, is reasonably demanding. And I'll leave it to you to decide in the end whether this is, is good news or bad news. And here's what we need. As I said, we're going to have two sides of the market, buyers and sellers. Buyers are, are called I and sellers are called J, and they both live in a set. You can think of this as a, a, a continuum. You can think of it as an infinite set. We don't need very much structure on that set. Agents, buyers and sellers in this model have types, and so types are given by beta and sigma for the buyers and sellers. A type is a characteristic of the agent. And then agents choose actions or take investments. These are going to be given by little b and little s. Think of the actions as the investments that they take by going to school. Think of the types as perhaps their aptitude or the cost to them of going to school. Think of the types as their ability, the actions, the practice, the acquisition of skills, of knowledge that they take to capitalize on that ability. Types are fixed. These are their characteristics. You can think of the types as being tattooed on their forehead so that there's nothing they can do about that. Actions, the investments, this is what they choose. This is where we're going to be looking for the efficiency. We want to know, will they be taking an equilibrium, the right actions or not? Agents are matched. If they're matched, they get utilities. U for the buyers, V for the sellers. And what this slide tells you is that in a match, utility depends on the buyer's type, the seller's type. The buyer's investment, the seller's investment. And a final variable up there that I've written as T, and you can interpret this as a transfer made from the buyer to the seller. That's an easy interpretation to keep in mind. There are many other possible interpretations we could have of that. What we require here is that there's some ability on the part of these agents to alter how they divide the surplus created by a match between the two of them. In technical terms, if these functions were linear in T, this would be a transferable utility model, or these would be quasi-linear utility functions. We're not going to require that. So we don't ask for transferable utility, but we exclude the case of purely non-transferable utility, the case in which there's no way for these players to transfer some of the surplus back and forth between them. And if they're unmatched, well, then they get some reservation utility. They get the outside option of pursuing the best unmatched activity that they can find, and that depends on their type and their investment. Not the other person's type, not the other person's investment, because there's no other person in that case. They're not matched. And as usual, these utility functions are, are continuous. That makes things a little easier here and there. And to keep the interpretation of this T as a way of shifting utility back and forth, the utility functions U and V of the buyer and seller have opposite signs in T. So as we move this variable around, one person's utility increases, the other person's utility decreases. So that's going to describe the possibilities open to an agent. Now we need to talk about an allocation. Fortunately, this is a whole lot easier than it looks. We can list what we need to describe an allocation in the economy, and that's the six things on the top of the slide. First, we have to know who's matched with whom, and so that's the first row there. First row is a pair of functions that map from buyers to sellers, from sellers to buyers, and tell us, indeed, who gets matched with whom. Second, we have to know what investments they take, so that's the second row. This is a pair of functions that tell us for each buyer type what investment they choose, for each seller type what investment they choose. Third, we have to know how each matched pair divides the surplus available in their match. And so that's the last line. It's a function that maps from buyers to sellers and tells us for each one how much utility they get. I've written this down as if everyone is matched. 
it's pretty straightforward to handle the case where some people decide to stay unmatched, and so we won't need extra notation for that. Now, there are two feasibility conditions that we need for a match. First, we have to make sure that the matching actually is a matching. It's not going to work if all the buyers on one side of the market try to match with a single seller on the other side of the market. It's not going to work if too many buyers try to match with too few sellers. And so the middle set of equations there tell us first that indeed we have matches when a buyer points to a seller and says, I would like to match with that seller. So does that seller point to the buyer and say, I would like to match with that buyer. And in the measure preserving condition, this is the, the requirement that we're try, trying to match too many buyers with, with too few sellers. And in the bottom line, this tells us that the utilities we're promising here have to be consistent with the matches and the investment. After all, an allocation tells us who's matched, tells us what investments they take and what utilities they get. If this is what we're going to claim we get from our economy, these utilities better be able to come from these matches and these investments. And that's what the bottom one tells us. So that's what an allocation looks like. That's the object that we want to talk about. This one, straightforward, an allocation is individually rational if no one does worse than they could do by remaining unmatched. The agents are always going to have the option of just saying, forget the matching market. I'll take my outside option, my reservation utility of, of remaining unmatched. OK, equilibrium. Think. In these terms, the only really important part on this slide is the fact that those three letters sit under the maximum sign. So what's going on in equilibrium here? Think of this room is divided up between buyers and sellers, and I line all the buyers up on that wall and all the sellers up on that wall, and now I, I turn to my sellers well, let's do the buyers first. I turn to my buyers and I say, look at the sellers on the other side of the room. Choose one. And when you choose that seller, choose a pair of investments and a transfer. This is where I'm calling attention to the fact that, where'd my pointer go? That under this maximum sign, you see a B, an S, and a T. When a buyer chooses a seller, the buyer can approach that seller and say, I'll take investment B, I propose you take investment S, and T describes how we'll exchange the fruits of our partnership between us. This is called an ex ante equilibrium. You might also call this a complete markets equilibrium. In this equilibrium, we can, when we take our investments, also sign contracts about who we're going to match with and how we're going to split the surplus in this match. In this equilibrium notion, there are no missing markets. We jointly determine everything of interest in the economy. And so all of my buyers look at the sellers. They point to a seller and say, have I got a deal for you? Here's my investment. There's your investment. And here's our transfer. All of my sellers are doing the same thing. They're sitting here looking at the buyers in that wall. They're pointing over at a buyer and say, I've got a deal for you, too. So this second maximization, here, here's my sellers doing this. And they're also choosing an investment for them, an investment for the buyer, and, and a transfer. And I have an equilibrium if, when I tell my buyers and sellers to do that, what do I end up with? I end up with pairs of buyers and sellers pointing at one another. The deals they propose are identical. They agree on these deals. The utilities they give are feasible. And these utilities for each person in the market is utility maximizing. There is no buyer over here who can say, I chose this seller, but I would have been better off if I chose that one. And there's no seller over here who says, I chose this seller, but I would have been better off chose this buyer, but I would have been better off if I had chosen that one. That's an ex ante equilibrium. Unfortunately, here's the one 
that we think is probably the more useful equilibrium concept, the one that is more likely to be applicable to the kinds of markets we deal with. This is called an ex-post equilibrium, and it looks very much like the ex-ante one, but look at what's under the max signs here. There's a letter missing. There's no S there, just a B and a T. And the one below it, there's no B, just an S and a T. In this market, the investments get sunk before the agents do their matching. So in this market, my buyers line up against that wall, and each one now is holding up a card that says, here's the investment I chose. And my sellers line up on this wall, and each is holding a card saying, here's the investment I chose. And so now when my buyers maximize, they look over the sellers, and they say, I would like to choose a seller and I'll propose to that seller a deal, but the only proposal I can make to that seller is the investment I will make and the transfer that's going to divide the surplus between us. And the sellers on this wall look over at the buyers, and each one of them says, I'll choose a buyer, I'll propose a deal, but the only proposal I can make is the investment I will take and the transfer. So when we do the matching, some of the decisions are already sunk. The equilibrium conditions look the same. It has to be the case again that given the sellers here and given the investments they have chosen, all of the buyers here pick a utility maximizing seller and pick the investment they would like to bring to that seller that happens to match the one on the card that they're holding. And all the sellers over here look at the buyers and look at their investments and these sellers all pick a buyer and they pick a seller investment to bring that happens to match the one on the card that they're holding. The difference between the ex ante and the ex post equilibrium now, what's the equilibrium condition? No buyer can look down my list of sellers and say, I've just found a better seller. Meaning, I've just found a seller whose type and whose investment I can work with so as to make myself better off. In the ex ante equilibrium, a buyer and seller pair could look at one another and they could choose a joint deal, a joint deviation, a joint pair of investments, an investment for the buyer, an investment for the seller in a transfer that could make them both better off. In the ex post equilibrium, I can imagine a buyer saying to a seller, given your investment, I can imagine something I should have done in a transfer that would make us both better off. And a seller can look at the buyer and say, given your investment, I can imagine an investment for me in a transfer that will make us both better off. They can entertain unilateral deviations. They can ask themselves, should I have come into this market with some different investment, hoping to match with someone different? But there's no pair of them who can ask, should we jointly have come into this market with different investments? That's the basic difference between ex ante and ex post equilibria. That's the basic difference between having a complete market and an incomplete market. Efficiency. We're going to look at two efficiency notions. The first one I'm going to call pairwise efficient. And I'm going to say an allocation is pairwise efficient if it has this property. It's impossible for me to find two agents With a property, I could put these two agents together, I could find a pair of investments for them, I could find a transfer for them that would make them both better off than in my proposed equilibrium. The slide has it written in the other way. The slide says, for every pair of agents, the equilibrium utilities I gi I'm giving them, that's the left side of those two equations, must at least equal the utility they could get if they matched with one another and chose their investments and chose a transfer. So there can be no discontented unmatched pairs. Now this idea, no discontented unmatched pairs, is going to come up a couple of times. And the key in, which in talking about pairwise efficiency is when we ask them, are they discontented or not, again, they get to entertain joint deviations in their investments. They get to ask, what if both of us chose some other investment? Because that's a deal they could have made at the ex-ante contracting stage. 
Indeed, this notion of pairwise efficiency sounds very much like the notion of ex ante equilibrium, and it's a straightforward result that these are equivalent. An allocation is pairwise efficient if and only if it's ex ante efficient. This is the counterpart of the two welfare theorems for this investment and matching market. And it's no surprise we can get the counterpart of the two welfare theorems here because the markets are complete. The argument is very much like it is in an ordinary general equilibrium model. So if we could rely on ex ante equilibria, we would have no efficiency problem. Pairwise efficiency is a stronger condition than Pareto efficiency. It suffices for Pareto efficiency. It's not necessary. And so again, if our markets were complete, our efficiency problems would be done. <coughs> Pairwise conditional efficiency. Once again, this is a no discontented pair of agents condition. Or I write it up there, pick up any pair of agents, look at their proposed utilities, that's what's on the left side of those equations, and those utilities must be at least as large as this pair of agents could get by matching with one another. Sounds just like we had in the previous slide. What's the difference? Go back to the previous slide. Once again, the difference is there are three letters under that maximum side. Under ex ante efficiency, when I look for a discontented pair, I tell them, suppose you could both do your lives over. Suppose you could both change investments. Would you want to do it? Yeah, they can't really do their lives over, but they get to think about this before they get into the market. When I talk about pairwise conditional efficiency, two letters, not three. The buyer can think of going to the seller and saying, I see your investment is fixed. Nothing I can do about that. But I can imagine what would have happened if I had chosen something different. And I could imagine whether that gives me a better deal or not. And if it does, then we have a discontented pair. And a seller can look at a buyer and say, I see that your investment is fixed. Nothing I can do about that. But I can imagine having come into this market with a different investment. And I can imagine checking whether that would make me better off. And so that's the conditional efficiency. Each side conditions on the investments of the other side and asks, do we wish we had something different? Could we have imagined doing something different? This is a weaker notion. It's a much weaker test for discontented pairs than before. This notion is equivalent to ex post equilibrium. An allocation is pairwise conditionally efficient, if and only if it's an ex post equilibrium. This is the counterpart of the welfare theorems for ex post equilibria. The difficulty is this is not a very strong efficiency condition. In fact, we're going to see in a moment just how weak this efficiency condition is. So we can get a welfare theorem for both equilibrium notions. That's not a surprise since we've rigged up the efficiency criteria to make that work. We're happy with the welfare theorem for the ex ante equilibrium. That's as nice an efficiency notion as we could hope for. I'm kind of disappointed in the efficiency notion for ex post equilibrium. Well, we're not done yet. We can connect these two, and this will explain the first result in the literature that surprised me. As I said, one of these efficiency notions is weaker than the other. Pairwise conditional efficiency is weaker than pairwise efficiency. To put this differently, pairwise efficiency implies pairwise conditional efficiency. Well now, the result just rolls off. Ex ante equilibrium implies pairwise efficiency. Pairwise efficiency implies pairwise conditional efficiency. Pairwise conditional efficiency implies ex post equilibrium. Every ex ante equilibrium is also an ex post equilibrium. Every ex ante equilibrium is pairwise efficient, not pairwise conditionally efficient, but pairwise efficient. Easy to show ex ante equilibria exists. Again, these are complete markets. It's easy to show the existence in a general equilibrium model with complete markets. And so what have we just gotten? There exist ex post equilibria that give us efficient outcomes pairwise efficient outcomes. And this is why the first couple of examples that showed up in the literature 
gave us efficient outcomes despite the incompleteness of the market. A way of thinking about the argument here, this is just like something you learned in calculus. You have to maximize a function of two variables, say. How do you do it? You take the first order conditions. You take two derivatives, one with respect to each variable, and you, and you solve them. But you could just as well have done this sequentially. You could have taken a derivative with respect to one variable and used that, plugged that result back into the function, and then taken a derivative with respect to the other one. In x ante equilibrium, when I think about two people matching, they are jointly choosing their investments. They're taking a derivative with respect to both variables at once and, and solving that. When I think about ex post equilibrium, and I think about two people matching, the buyer is conditioning on the seller's investment, treating that as fixed and maximizing by just choosing the derivative in the buyer's investment. The seller is conditioning on the buyer's investment, thinking of that as fixed and just taking own derivative. But if I happen to fix these investments at the same level as would have come from taking the joint derivatives, I'm going to get just the same outcome. If the people anticipate the other side of the market correctly, the fact that those investments are sunk before we get into the market is going to be no problem. If I tell my buyers, match with your sellers, jointly choose your investments, they'll say fine. If I tell my buyers, match with your sellers, and your sellers have fortuitously already chosen the correct investments, buyers are going to say that's fine and do the same thing. So that's our first result. Incomplete markets don't have to give us inefficiency. There will always exist equilibria that satisfy the strongest notion of efficiency we could want, pairwise efficiency. However, in general, there are many, many other ex post equilibria, some of them wildly inefficient. The easiest way to construct an example of this is to choose your technology. When I say choose your technology, I mean choose the utility function. Choose the utility functions so that it's only worthwhile for one side to invest if the other does as well. And if you have utility functions that have that property, then you always have a trivial equilibrium where nobody invests. And the buyers say, what's the point? The sellers are not investing. I don't get a chance to see my sellers until after they have taken their non-investment decision. And so there's no point in my doing it. And the sellers say, what's the point? These crazy buyers on the other side are all holding up zeros. And given that they're holding up zeros, there's no point in my investing. That's an extreme example. If that were the only other example, I might not be too worried about that. I don't expect that one day we're going to wake up and an entire generation of people has decided not to go to school. But there are many, many other equilibria, many of them less extreme than that. There are many, many ways for this to go wrong. Notice it's important here that the investment is two-sided. The coordination failure requires that both sides not have taken the correct investment. If I had a market with only one-sided investments, I would have no problem. Then the only ex post equilibrium would be efficient. Now the difficulty is I believe in most of the markets that I'm thinking of, there are non-trivial investments on both sides. People do acquire human capital to get into the labor market. Employers do make investments in order to make use of that human capital. And so a one-sided result is, is not going to be very reassuring. What can we say about when ex post equilibria will be efficient? Well, I'm going to have to introduce one more efficiency notion. I want to think about the sets of buyer investments and seller investments that are what I'll call in the market. I say a buyer investment is in the market if my sellers can look at my buyers lined up over here and they're holding up the cards that have the investments on them and that investment appears on one of the cards. And a seller investment is in the market if my sellers over here are holding up their cards telling us what their investment is and that investment is there. And so that's what that first line says. And I'm going to say that an equilibrium 
is pairwise constrained efficient, unfortunately a name very close to conditionally efficient, pairwise constrained efficient, if it solves this maximization problem. Again, most of this can ignore. All, all that matters is to look at what lies under the max sign. And you say, it doesn't look like max to me. Well, no, it's supremum. And, and we, had to, uh, we had to hedge our bets here because we can't be sure that these solutions exist. But that's, that's not very important. What's under the max sign? Three variables again. So we're talking about buyers and sellers who can match with one another and both choose the buyer investment and the seller investment. But not any buyer investment and seller investment. Only buyer investments that are in the market and only seller investments that are in the market. So pairwise efficiency, when we allow people to match, they can jointly choose any investment. Conditional efficiency, when they match, they can only entertain choosing one investment subject to the other one being fixed. Constrained efficiency, when they match, any investment, but only from those that are in the market. How's that help? Well, now we can line up all of our efficiency notions. On the first and last line, I had the two welfare theorems I had earlier. Ex ante equilibrium, that's equivalent to pairwise efficiency. Last line, ex post equilibrium, that's that equivalent to pairwise conditional efficiency. Pairwise constrained efficiency sits in the middle. In particular, if I have pairwise constrained efficiency, then I have pairwise conditional efficiency. And the argument for that is a pretty simple exercise in thinking about how markets work. What does it mean to say that I fail pairwise constrained efficiency? That means I have a buyer-seller pair who could match with one another, who could make themselves better off than they are in my proposed allocation. And they could do that by jointly choosing their investments, but jointly choosing their investments from things that are in the market. And now one can show it's just a quick bookkeeping exercise that if this pair could match with one another and make themselves better off by choosing investments that are in the market already, at least one of them could have gone to the person holding that investment in the market and make themselves better off by matching with that person. So how does this help? Now we're going to hear, we're going to see shades of what I pointed to in Alicia's A Difficulty in the Concept of Fairness. I'm going to say that preferences are separable if they have this property. What's it mean that they have this property? Look at the top line. This is the buyer's utility. And what you see is on the right side, sigma does not appear. Seller's utility is on the bottom line, and what you see is that on the right side, beta does not appear. What's it mean that sigma and beta does not appear? It means that the buyers in this market care about the seller investments, but not the seller types. Sellers in this market care about the buyer investments, but not the buyer types. Suppose, for example, something that some of us will spend a great deal of time doing in the weeks to come. You're in a faculty meeting thinking about new PhDs who might be prospective new faculty members for your department. And someone says, this person has a great job market paper. That's all that matters. I think we should hire them. That's a person with separable preferences. The investment is the job market paper. The type is some other characteristic of the individual. This person is saying, who cares about the individual? I like the job market paper. That's enough. Another person says, I like this candidate. Job market paper is uninteresting. But this is a really talented person. Those are not separable preferences. Those are preferences where payoffs depend on the type as well as the investment. <coughs> or you're auditioning players for your jazz band 
someone walks in, you say, let me hear you play the saxophone. They play, and if you say, now we're done, your preferences are separable. If you have more questions, then probably your preferences are not separable. Ah, so bottom line. If preferences are separable, then X post equilibria are pairwise constrained efficient. So to put that in perspective, here's, here's my ranking of efficiency notions. I'd like to find a way to close the gap between ex ante and ex post equilibria. I'd like conditions under which my ex post equilibria have the nice efficiency properties of ex ante equilibria. I know some of the ex post equilibria always have these nice efficiency properties. I'd like them all to. So far, as far as I could get, is to pairwise conditional efficiency, and that's not very close. What we've just seen is that if we have separability, we can get all the way to pairwise constrained efficiency. If we have separable preferences, we have just ruled out some of the things that can go wrong in this market. If we have separable preferences, we have eliminated some of the coordination failures that could appear in this market. Without separability, a coordination failure arises because I have a buyer and seller pair who would like to have matched with one another, who would have gotten a great deal from matching with one another had they chosen the right investments, but they did not. They chose something else. Under separability, for that to be a problem, not only must it be the case that these agents didn't choose the right investments, but no one else in the market must have chosen those right investments. Under separability, if anyone in the market chose what would have been the right investment for my potentially disconcerted couple, that's enough to preclude, that, uh, that's enough to ensure that this couple would have wanted to take their right investments. They would have wanted to do that to seek matches with the other side of the market that took, that, took that investment. What we have done here is limit the extent to which it matters with whom you matched. Without separability, people in this market are two-dimensional, types and investments. With separability, in effect, they're only one-dimensional, only investments matter. Limits the extent to which who you trade with matters, provides more, essentially more competition in this market, limits the extent of coordination failures. So this is the second thing that came out of this work that surprised us. Indeed, the early papers in this work just assumed that preferences were separable. Just because that was an easy, it was a natural way to write them down. It, you want to make a simple model, you have people investing, it's easy to say, let's suppose all that matters once they've taken their investment is that investment. <coughs> and at first, indeed, we thought that it was indeed just a, a, a nice, convenient modeling assumption. Turns out it's, it's going to be quite important. So, separability closes one, takes us one step of the way. This is the argument that it does. I think we can skip that. Separable preferences limit the scope for coordination failures. To a large extent, I just gave this argument. If we're going to have a coordination failure here, we have to not only have chosen the wrong thing, no one else can have chosen what would have been the right thing for us. So with separability, coordination failures have to be sort of market-wide coordination failures. Now, what can go wrong with an equilibrium? Where could the efficiency come from? Three places. First, we could find a pair of people who are matched, but they may have chosen the wrong investments. What do I mean by the wrong investments? If they had known they were going to be matched with one another, if they could have coordinated their investment choices, they would have both chosen something different. I'm going to say that in this case, there's an exchange, a failure of exchange efficiency, just conditioning on the exchange between this pair. We're not getting the right thing. We may have not enough people in the market. We may have people matched in the wrong way in the market. So we're going to look at each of these three possible sources of inefficiency. 
Now, there's two ways to think about getting the investments correct conditional on having a pair matched. First, suppose we have a separable technology. I know we might not, but we might in some cases believe we do, and so let's look at that case. Suppose we have separability, and in that case, getting people to take the right investments conditional on being matched is a matter of getting enough investments in the market. The coordination failures here are that things just are absent from the market altogether. So one thing we could do, I mentioned a paper that does this, is we could assume that for every investment, there is some type for whom that investment is a dominant strategy. That's going to ensure that every investment is in the market. And that, together with separability, will ensure we never have people making the wrong investments. Another possibility, in the last bullet point here, is to assume that the types of agents are what I will call sufficiently dispersed. There's a technical condition, in fact, a number of technical conditions behind that. Sufficiently dispersed means they're going to choose lots of different investments. And so we're going to get lots of investments in the market. These are both wonderful insights. I'll suggest the first one, the dominant strategy one, is often a little strong. And there are some basic difficulties with the second one that, that we won't spend too much time on. Instead, another approach to getting the investment right is going to bring back a familiar condition. And so this is going to be the first of my stringent question mark conditions. And for that, I want to go back to the maximization problems that lie behind this. And again, all we need to see is what lies under the max sign. X post equilibrium, again, the buyers are acting as if the sellers have already taken their investments. And the buyers are thinking, they're anticipating, I'm going to come into the market where the sellers along this wall are holding up that distribution of investments. And I have to choose my investment. I have to choose my investment and think about how we're going to split the surplus. And sellers are thinking the same thing. I anticipate how the buyers are going to be lined up when I get into the market. And I have to think about what investment do I want to come into the market with and how are we going to make use of this. Now, it would be really nice if these two problems together would imply this one. Because this is the problem, the ex-ante problem, where the buyer and the seller get to jointly choose their investments. And so <coughs> when I first said that every ex-ante equilibrium is an ex-post equilibrium, I went one way in drawing the analogy to solving a maximization problem. I said if we solve the, the joint problem, then surely we have solved the two separate problems, where we fix one variable at its optimal level and tell the other side to optimize, and then fix the other side at its optimal level and tell the first side to optimize. I'd like to go the other way. I'd like to say if I can solve the two separate problems, I've solved the joint problem. Now, here, I can't be sure that I've fixed a variable at its optimal level. I have to ask, suppose I can find any pair of variables such that conditional on this seller investment, this is what the buyer might want to do. Conditional on this buyer investment, this is what the seller might want to do. When does that imply that I've jointly maximized that problem? And the answer is, it does if the utility functions are quasi-concave. Now, quasi-concavity, usually when we solve, uh, when we construct models, we're used to just letting an assumption of quasi-concavity roll off the tongue. We're used to saying, of course, utility functions are quasi-concave. What else might they be? Well, it turns out, though, in the matching context, it's easy to find 
pretty common utility functions that are not quasi-concave. Here's one of the simplest ones. Buyer has to take an investment. Let's suppose that's just a number. Seller has to choose an investment. Let's suppose that's just a number. What's the value created in their match? Suppose we have quasi-linear utility, so we just fix a point, fix a value for that match, and then we can divide it up between them in any way that we want by setting the transfer between them two. What's the value in that match? If you were going to construct an example, one of the obvious things you would think of is that the value of a match from a buyer who has chosen investment S and a seller, a buyer who's chosen B and a seller who's chosen S is B times S. It's a wonderful function. It's a super modular function. It's going to assure positive assortative matching. That idea will come up in just a moment. And it's not quasi-concave. So if you believe in quasi-concavity or not, you can argue as follows. On the plus side, you can say, we always assume preferences are quasi-concave. And on the other side, you can say, rules out the most obvious example. So it gives us a condition. It remains open, perhaps, just what we should think of that condition. Notice here, I made quasi-concavity fail with this example, even with separable preferences. If we let preferences not be separable, it can go. It can be even worse. The proof is just a straightforward comparison of the Kuhn-Tucker conditions. It turns out, under quasi-concavity, showing that you have solved the two maximization problems separately is equivalent to showing that you have, you have <coughs> solved them jointly. Another way of saying that is that <coughs> it's true that you, in the ex post equilibrium, solve them separately. And if there are lots of ways to solve them separately, there's no reason to believe that's going to cause you to solve the joint problem. Quasi-concavity limits the number of ways you can solve them, solve them separately. And that's the basic insight into showing that that is equivalent to solving the joint problem. Inadequate participation, I don't have much to say about this. You uh, can try to read the proposition, but I advise against it. Uh, essential condition here is if you make a strong enough assumption that matches are valuable, everyone's going to want to be in a match. And that's about the best we can do in terms of uh, making sure we have the right people in and out of the market. So there's not a great deal of insight there. The buyers and the sellers who are in the market, they might match with, with the wrong people. Here's a case where I think there's especially room for work on this. The, our approach here is going to be to look for a condition under which we know what the matching must look like in order to be efficient, and then argue every ex post equilibrium has to have that match. So we're going to look for a case where we know how the people have to be matched in order to satisfy pairwise efficiency, the strong efficiency condition we would like and to argue that we have to have that. Now, the basic difficulty here is in all of matching, there are basically only two things we can say. We can say when matching is going to be positive assortative, we can say when matching is going to be negative assortative. And past that, there's very little. So already, to even talk about positive assortative and negative assortative matching, I'm asking that my types be an interval. I didn't say that at the beginning. In general, we could think of types being much more complicated, but here, they're, they're going to have to be simple. And for this to work, I'm going to assume that preferences are separable, so this comes back. Separability, initially we thought, played a role just in getting the investments right, but it's going to play a role in getting the matching right now as well. And to put this differently, I said that quasi-concavity might be even more likely to fail if my preferences weren't separable. Well. I need separability here, so might as well have it there as well. So that helps me a little bit in that case. Suppose my preferences are separable. Suppose my preferences satisfy a single crossing condition. Again, you can make, uh, you can look at the equation, but a single crossing condition 
says the following. I can think of my buyers being now ordered from low to high, and my sellers over there ordered from low to high. And Single Crossing says that higher sellers are especially likely to want higher buyers. And higher buyers are especially likely to have higher sellers. If that's the case, separability and single crossing together will ensure that my matching is positive assortative. Higher sellers and higher buyers will indeed match with one another. Once I've lined them up in sort of order, I can just take my two walls and push them together like that. And I get the low end together down here, I get the mediums together, I get the highs together up there. That's positive assortative matching. We have positive assortative matching if the best students go to the best schools. Negative assortative matching would match them just the other way. We have positive assortative matching when we think about height of married people. It used to be said that we had negative assortative matching when we talked about incomes of married people. Uh, more recently, that looks quite a bit more positively assortative. If I have single crossing, and if I have separability, I'm going to have positive assortative matching in every equilibrium. The separability I need so that I can order my buyers and sellers according to just one dimension, their investments, and so that that invest dimension is the only thing the other side cares about. And then the single crossing does the rest for me. Skip the argument. Put this together. Let these conditions hold. What do I need? Quasi-concave preferences, sufficiently lucrative matches, single crossing, and separability. The first one gave me efficient investments. The second one made sure I have the people in the market I want in the market. The third one makes sure I have them matched in the right way. If I do that, every ex post equilibrium is efficient. Now, on the one hand, Quasi-concave preferences, as I said, we work with all the time. Separability, those were the obvious formulations that first appeared in the literature. Single crossing, single crossing is the bread and butter of all sorts of work in incomplete information. So on the one hand, these are all familiar conditions. On the other hand, together, I think a reasonably strong set of conditions. So as a result, Glass half empty or half full? I can imagine people taking either side on this. This is why there's the question mark after the stringency here. What have we done so that we draw this distinction between ex ante and ex post markets? Ex ante markets are the ones we can handle with our usual techniques. This is just general equilibrium theory. Ex post markets, that's the problem we think we have to deal with. First result was that every ex ante equilibrium is also an ex post equilibrium. This gives us the existence of efficiency. This tells us we're not dead to begin with in hoping that these markets can work well. But there are lots of other coordination failure equilibria. Coordination failures at least raises the specter that there's something we may be able to do about this, that they may be amenable to policy. Separability makes that easier. Then what we need to do is just get the right investments in the market. We can imagine priming the market in that case. And indeed, separability turns out to play a role in this set of sufficient conditions that we have for these markets to work well. The separability, I view this again as distant echoes of the ideas that first appeared in the difficulty with the concept of fairness. And so I hadn't looked at that paper for a long time. I was pleased to see that come back. Now, anticipating where I would be this time. This part of the talk is something I leave to you after, after we're done here. Thank you. Questions? Happy for questions. Please.
was exposed to the uh, sub-revolved uh, uh, efficient mechanism for allocating, you know, to, 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 to get uh, the efficient uh, associative, I guess it is associative method. Now, I, I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, the, this kind of, the kind of framework that they have, does that correspond to your exposed equilibrium after investments have been made? Yes. So let me rephrase that question. Uh, the model I gave has two stages. First, the investment stage, and then the matching stage. And we already have a tremendous amount of work that has been done on matching models without the investment stage. And you mentioned the Gale Shapley algorithm, which is the first result that most people think about in that equilibrium. It produces uh, matching that may be positive assortative, doesn't have to be depending on how the payoffs line up, but it gives a stable match. One difference is, is Gail Shapley works with finite set of agents on each side of the market, and much of our literature is for finite sets of agents. I want to allow the possibility of an uh, infinite number of agents on each side of the market. That helps me think about this as a competitive market. That's primarily a technical difference, though. The same kind of ideas that showed existence of equilibria via Gale Shapley can work for the infinite markets here. But in the Gale Shapley, there, there, is no advance, there is no advance in investment. That's right. And they come, they, they already have the, the, let's say, the, the, the investment done, and that's it. That, only one stage. Here you have that's right. So the difference here is the investment stage that comes first. All right, thank you.